Welcome to Real Clear Radio Hour, brought to you by the Competitive Enterprise Institute. I'm your host, Bill Frezza. This week, we take one more pass at digital privacy, looking more broadly into the legal, commercial, and constitutional implications. In the second half of our show, we'll be joined by noted legal scholar, litigator, and author, Randy Barnett, director of the Georgetown Center for the Constitution. Up first, we have Nula O'Connor, president and CEO of the Center for Democracy and Technology. Nula is a former privacy executive at GE, Amazon.com, and DoubleClick, and was the chief counsel for technology at the U.S. Department of Justice and the first chief privacy officer at the Department of Homeland Security. Nula, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Nula, looking at your resume, you seem to have worked on multiple sides of the privacy issue. Consumers, companies, and the government often have conflicting interests. Whose side are you on? I am and always have been on the side of the individual. So yours, mine, your (laughs) grandmother's, your child's. We are here at CDT to defend, protect, and advance the individual's civil liberties, human rights in the digital world. So that's a pretty tall order. Privacy in the digital age is such a broad subject, but let, let me start with some philosophy. Let me read a quote from one of my favorite authors and get your reaction. She writes, Civilization is the progress towards a society of privacy. The savage's whole existence is public, ruled by the laws of his tribe. Civilization is the process of setting man free from men. How does this view of privacy square with the expansive roles and responsibilities of modern government bureaucracies? Well, first of all, who's your favorite writer? I love that quote. (laughs) It's Ayn Rand. Oh, fascinating. (laughs) That wouldn't have been what I would have thought. But I love the quote. And that hopefully means we are advancing in the right direction of greater sense of personal space and dignity. But there are many who would fear that in Ayn Rand's version of the world, or in, frankly, many of our current versions Mm -hmm. of the world, we're seeing an erosion of privacy, both by the constant kind of intrusion of digital life and digital devices Mm -hmm. and surveillance from both the government and from the private sector Mm -hmm. that erodes a sense of of dignity and of personal space and of privacy. And privacy, again, is only one of the many, many issues we work on here at CDT, but the sense of personal self, what we call the digital self in the online world, really permeates all of our work across our entire issue agenda portfolio and really all of the human and, and civil rights that we deal with. We are here to espouse the idea that you have fundamental human dignity and that dignity is respected online even as you go about your ordinary daily life, use your technology in daily life, whether it's your Facebook account, your LinkedIn account, Mm -hmm. your Twitter account, the devices in your home, the devices in your car, and leverage all of the great things that technology has to offer, but that you still have certain kind of inalienable rights or rights in your information and your data That's not to say that you can't do great work and engage with responsible businesses online. That's not to say, and again, surveillance and government intrusion is one of our core issues, Mm -hmm. but it's not to say that government doesn't have a legitimate need to have some information for legitimate law enforcement, national security, or other governmental purposes, but there have to be boundaries. And, you know, we're here as one of the many voices who do, I think, great work in this area to be constantly vigilant and on guard against unwarranted and excessive intrusion into your personal life. Let's talk about that. I mean, in recent years, the federal government has criminalized such a wide range of civil uh, infractions through its regulatory agencies. Besides the IRS, the SEC, OSHA, the new CFPB, ATF, EPA, DHS, the EEOC, all have an interest in penetrating our privacy to get the information they need to monitor and control our behavior. What's the limiting principle? Right now, I'm not sure there is a limiting principle for many who work in the government. I was very privileged to work at both the Department of Commerce and, more importantly, the Department of Homeland Security as one of the first privacy officers there under the great Tom Ridge, our very first Secretary of Homeland Security. And I learned a lot from him, and I think he learned a little bit from me in our our conversation about what information is really necessary. And he's a very, very wise man in many ways, but one of the things he said to me was, you know, more data is not necessarily better data. More data is just more data. And so we want a government that is, again, limited and efficient. And having too much data, as I saw in the private sector and in the government, is not actually a benefit. Having the right data is obviously a benefit. And in in the case of the government, having too much data about your citizens is also an intrusion and tips the balance of power between the individual and the state. And I come from probably a a fairly strong, limited government Mm -hmm. view, and I I want to see a, a a good and effective government that keeps my children safe, that keeps our world as safe as possible from terrorists and criminals. But 
I also recognize that there's a data glut. I come to CDT, at, as we call it, CDT 3.0. We are mm-hmm. no longer the internet of desktop computers. Mm-hmm. We are no longer even the internet of mobile phones, but we are really the internet of, I don't call it of things, I really call it the internet of people, but it's the internet of everywhere. The, you know, the internet connectivity will be embedded in the walls of your house and the dashboard of your car. This is all fantastic. There's potentially great, great life-saving benefits and, you know, and, and efficiency benefits. But with that comes an incredible amount of data, granularity of data about your personal habits and life and preferences that can be used to make decisions about you in the real world that are quite, I wouldn't say catastrophic, but very, very concerning. And not just in the government space, but we just, one of my team is working on a great project on on algorithms. And there was a great study recently, I I wish I could remember exactly who did the study, on impact of algorithms um, embedded in your ordinary kind of internet surfing. And again, let's not be crazy and scary Mm -hmm. about the word algorithms. It's simply just the decision-making process embedded in the computer that, you know, helps you facilitate your web surfing or the device, you know, uh, working or or whatever. But in this case, the, the study showed that women online were less likely to get offers in the job space for CEO and senior executive jobs than men were in completely kind of otherwise equal online environments for job searching and, and, and whatever based. And of course, those, those decision making processes are based entirely on your web surfing habits or where you've been or whatever. So what the outcome here would, could potentially be that there's a discriminatory impact of what seem like innocuous or benign embedded decision making processes in the computer itself, what are essentially opaque decision making processes. You know, that's concerning enough when we're talking about job opportunities or financial opportunities, say one set of people based on their online experience are getting offers for credit or mortgages or car loans or whatever Mm -hmm. at this interest rate, but another group is getting a different rate based on zip code or based on preferences or based on what you've done online or what people like you have done online. That's concerning. And of course, there are laws that exist already like the Fair Credit Reporting Act and others that can address these issues. But the decision-making processes, again, when the data and the decision-making is in the hands of the government to my mind, still have higher stakes and always will when the government can deprive you of life and liberty and, and access to benefits and, and, and freedom of expression or movement, et cetera, the, the consequences are a lot higher. And so we do need to be really vigilant. We want our government to be effective and, and to use technology in good and legitimate ways, but we do not want to see a world where opaque decisions are made about us that can deprive us of basic rights. So, Newell, you just raised a lot of issues, one of which is the government's mandate by the people to make sure everyone is fair, that your employers are fair, that people offering you bank credit are fair. And in order to do this, they need a lot of information about you, and they need to pass rules about how other people use information about you. How can we possibly balance those competing interests? Well, that's a great question. I'm curious how you phrased it, because, yes, there are certain government mandates for fairness or non-discrimination, but I also think it's the right thing to do. So the question is really, what are the values that the companies are putting into place? What are the values that we as a country are putting into place culturally? And simply, does the technology validate or kind of promote those values or not? And I think most of us are on the same playing field that we live in a country where we, you know, we want to see the Constitution upheld. We want to see democratic values espoused and, and furthered. So I wouldn't necessarily see this as a government mandate. I would see this as a kind of ethical and, um, you know, societal mandate to create the kinds of societies that we want to see going forward and to leverage our best human capital. You use the word we quite a bit, and you started out saying you were focused on the individual. That's kind of a conflict. If you look at corporations who have certain values, why must they have the same values as other corporations? Well, they mustn't, but I think they should be at least transparent about the values that they are putting forth, and then people can make a decision about whether they want to do business with those companies or not. That's usually how it works in the marketplace. Yeah, but it doesn't, right, is what I'm saying. In the use of algorithms, the use of embedded technologies, we love the speed, we love the efficiency, but we're not always mindful of what are the factors going into the decisions to show us not just an ad, but actual content online or show us different opportunities. What we're seeing in this country is actually your content is being tailored for you and personalized for you in a great way that gets you information and access to to goods and services that you need. But what we're also seeing is that, you know, my content, what I experience online is going to be so different from yours that we may never have anything to talk about in common again, that Republicans and Democrats in this country are seeing such different kind of 
what we worried about is kind of the bubble, right? The information mm-hmm. bubble. You're seeing only things that are self-fulfilling and self-validating. That's probably not a value that we really want to see because it leads to the breakdown of society and the ability to actually have respectful and responsible discourse with people who disagree. So CDT's solution to this is is what? Transparency, first of all, not necessarily about the literal algorithm, the, the ones and zeros of, mm-hmm. of, of programming, but rather how companies are making decisions about what they're choosing. I'll give you an example. I worked for a great company, a ter- truly terrific internet company. You might have heard of it. It's called Amazon. And right there on your homepage, you get served up information or products or whatever. And right there in the titles of those sections, here we're going to show you something based on what you've looked for before. Or we're going to show you something based on what mm-hmm. other people we think, you know, you've looked for that are looking for similar products. Right there in the titles of the sections, the, the company strives to provide disclosure and transparency in a really effective and simple way for the end user. I'm not calling for long-worded privacy policies that no one's going to read. I've written more of those in my mm-hmm. career than I'd care to admit, but rather simply a dialogue with the consumer that allows them to really engage and help make decisions that are really going to further, even if something as frivolous as their online shopping experience. It's, Amazon will let you tailor your ad preferences to say, no, I want to see ads for this and not that. You know, that's a great kind of biofeedback mechanism, again, on a very you know, kind of simple basis that I think really shows respect for the individual. So you're talking about codes of conduct, not necessarily laws that are going to get an attorney general chasing after a company. Many of those laws already exist, right? The State Unfair and Deceptive Trade Practice Act and the Section 5 of the FTC Act. I'm, I'm not necessarily calling for new laws, although there are some gaps in our, our understanding of privacy and data that could be addressed and by an omnibus federal privacy law that might simplify, frankly, the, the, the playing field for many. But I, whether it takes the form of codes of conduct or new legislation, there are some basic dignity principles I think many good companies are already getting behind. The White House recently released a discussion draft of a Consumer Piracy Bill of Rights. What was in it? A whole bunch of things we were surprised to see. The original draft of the Consumer Privacy Bill of Rights a few years ago was a terrific, terrific document. The most recent draft kind of splinters its its energy in a lot of different areas mm. in ways that we frankly didn't really support. But again, I think having looked at this issue globally for a long time, we are an outlier in the global dialogue on privacy and information in a way that doesn't provide the individual certainty, that doesn't really actually help the market in our country, and is potentially hurting companies in, in our country in the global marketplace as well. If this becomes law, it, it states that covered entities should act reasonably. It says that over and over again in each section. What the heck does that mean, and isn't that just an invitation to endless litigation? That is a very good question, and I think I would agree with you that that is uh, is not clear enough for companies or our individuals, frankly, in the marketplace. What would happen if this Bill of Rights was applied not just to the collection of data by corporations, but by government agencies? <laughs> I think the government would be in a lot more trouble than the companies would be. <laughs> I read the That's Bill of awesome. Rights this morning, and it's astounding how the government exempts itself. Over and over again, That's, it exempts itself. Well, right, exactly. Don't you think that, like, ultimately, the, the first line should be, you know, do unto others as you would have done it, you right? Think. They should be absolutely applying many of these rules to themselves. And again, it's not that I'm calling for, we are not a group that's going to call for the NSA to be disbanded or whatever, but we want to see really good guardrails and really good, uh, you know, we can't necessarily know all the secret sauce of all of the operations that are are clandestine or or, um, secret, but we really need to know that there are accountability mechanisms, that there's oversight, that there are limitations. I don't want my children growing up in a world where the default setting of all of their devices is that every data point ends up in the hands of the federal government. (laughs) That is simply unacceptable to me as an American, and I really think people should be a lot more concerned about this issue than, than we seem to be, and I think it's because we here at CDT are really looking at what this world looks like 20, 30, 40, 50 years from now when we leverage the best that technology has to offer, and we are really kind of always on, but that means a lot of data. So let me make it easy for you. Take the CIA and the NSA off the table. Take national security off the table. Make that a separate conversation. Mm -hmm, Let's mm -hmm. just look at every other three, four, and five-letter agency that demands information about us, either all the time or when it takes interest in us. And particularly in the latter, when an agency takes interest in us and subpoenas us or comes after us for an administrative law breach, we're obliged to turn over an awful lot of information. How come the Fourth Amendment doesn't protect us from that? 
You know, that is such a great question, and I think more people should be thinking along those lines. It's certainly something I looked at when I was in the government. We have a Paperwork Reduction Act notice, right, where uh, organizations have to limit themselves in how much a burden it is for you to produce the documents and produce your, you know, tax Mm -hmm. filings, et cetera. But we've only recently come to the idea that there's a privacy impact on the individual for these kinds of governmental requests. And you're right. Once you're under investigation or suspicion, there seem to be no holds barred. Oh, God forbid you should throw something away because now you've committed a crime against discovery of document discovery. That's right. And I've seen that in in the corporate space as well as in individual space that it's a great burden and there's usually kind of enthusiasm, shall we say, on the parts of, of well-intentioned investigators, but that creates a real intrusion on the, on the privacy of the, of the individual. And I think you're right. It's a dialogue we, we have just begun, and we are really just the, the tip of it with the national security and law enforcement agencies. But really what we are, you know, I think strong proponents of is really minding the wall, right, between the individual and the government and saying, you know, just because the data is out there doesn't mean it should end up in the hands of the government. And an argument I hear in this space all the time is, well, you put it on Facebook, so it's okay. Mm. Well, that's just ridiculous, first of all. If you know how to set your privacy settings on Facebook, you know that it can be a very closed space that's just between you and your family or you and your friends. And the fact that I use new digital technology or new digital devices does not mean de facto that I have abdicated my privacy. It's just a fallacy. It's, it's a new mechanism. It's a new technology. It's a new device. It doesn't mean that my attitudes towards privacy are different. Simply engaging in digital life with commercial entities does not mean that I think we should blur the lines between the corporate world and the government space. It's not a free pass. Right. There's some legislation called ECPA that seems to be forming up in Congress. Tell us about that. The Electronic Privacy Communications Act. ECPA, one of our favorite laws here at CDT. It is actually an older law that is up for renewal. And really, under kind of previous generations of email, the idea was people weren't really using email as a major form of communications. And it was really kind of a one off. Mm-hmm. You know, the scientists and engineers and universities used it, that sort of thing. And there was simply no expectation of privacy or no need for a warrant or subpoena or any kind of search legitimacy from the government. Back when the law was written, 86, something like that? Right, back when the law was written. I don't know all the dates. Now email and emerging technology are so much more a part of our daily lives and so much more instrumental to our communications that we are simply asking for an update of ECPA to make it look more like the reality that we all live in where much of our communications... I get up in the morning and frankly, some of the first things I do are check my email, Mm -hmm. check my Facebook, check my LinkedIn, whatever... This is how I communicate with my children's schools, their teachers, my office, my babysitter. And everything's commingled. Everything, right. Not only work and home are commingled, but the device itself is my primary means of communication. In Mm -hmm. fact, I've long joked that it's an insult to call it a phone. It's not really a phone. It's my little mini computer, or we need a new word for it, because my phone also is now so big that it's really back to almost those, you know, 1980 phones that Mm. (laughs) we all used to carry around. But it's really my own little personal digital assistant, right? To assume that after a certain number of weeks that the government could simply ask for those emails and get them without any legitimate legal predicate, it simply doesn't reflect today's reality. That's all there is to it. It's not that the principle of of the law has profoundly changed, but the technology in this case has advanced to a place where minor tweaks, and we're talking minor tweaks in terms of years and days and months. We're not talking profound changes in the language of the law. And we had a core commitment from members of Congress last fall, and we couldn't quite get it over the finish line. We're hopeful that, you know, Congress will do the right thing and simply update the law to reflect Americans' reality today. Give us some specific examples of items that CDT are pushing in ECPA. Updating the the length of time that emails are considered private and considered yours Hmm. to really comport with the fact that it's more like a letter. It's more like your, you know, your post office letter. You expect the letters to be delivered to you sealed, right? You Mm -hmm. don't expect that the government is is going to be prying on, uh, you know, into your letters without some legitimate law enforcement predicate. We'd like to see that apply to, as you correctly pointed out, the longer time period, not just to law enforcement and national security agencies, but to all agencies. And that's where we're hitting some some blowback is some of the civil agencies who want kind of more unfettered well, of uh, discretion. Who could care if the NSA, I don't care if the NSA sees all my stuff. What are they going to do to me? But I do care if the SEC, the IRS, OSHA, and the rest of them, that's what I care about. 
funny you should call out the SEC because that has been actually one of our, our um, challenges is uh, is explaining to the SEC how individuals really have a sense of privacy in their in their email communications. And we'd really like to see the use of, again, legitimate warrants, subpoenas, law enforcement processes for the civil agencies as well as the criminal ones. I mean, if you're a broker on Wall Street and you delete emails or even if you delete your messages, you go to jail. We have someone running for president today that deleted quite a few emails and nobody seems to be making a fuss over that. What's going on? Really? Uh, I'm forbidden from commenting as a (laughs) nonpartisan, non-campaign person, but I do think that there's been an overstepping by the civil agencies and we're very concerned. I think your, your point is very well taken that this is not only a law enforcement and national security issue, it is a government-wide intrusion issue and we need to be mindful of it. So, Nulo, the European regulators seem to have a very different view of commercial privacy than we do here in the U.S. How is this impacting U.S. companies? That is uh, the perfect question because it is impacting U.S. companies, and it's impacting citizens, frankly, globally. I am fascinated by this issue, and I've worked, again, in multinational companies for a long time. The differences in the regulatory regimes are quite stark in how the laws are applied. I've always said, however, that culturally, we still have a great deal in common with Europe, and the values of respect for the individual, you know, the need for, again, government safety and and, and legitimate government Mm. intrusion, but not excessive, are a lot closer than the differences that we all make make them out to be. But the laws do seem to be diverging. And the potential harm on global data flows, both for the individual to express their voice Mm. and to communicate globally, but also for companies to be able to simply, as I used to say when I was at GE, pay their own employees, you know, and and issue paychecks in other countries are really, really significant. And so, you know, I'm I'm part of a number of working groups, cross-border working groups, both at CDT and in my, you know, hat as a former government employee, to try to create better harmonization. And, you know, I I do worry a little bit about the kind of territoriality of, of, you know, companies who are coming in from outside a particular country being perceived as, as, uh, you know, as threats to, Mm. um, to, to companies in country, whether, whatever country that might be. But I do believe fundamentally that we have more in common socially and culturally, we've got to get to the bottom of, of, of those values and create at least bridges, create structures that can align and respect each other's legal systems. I think the first step there is, is knowledge. I'm still amazed by the conversations I have where there's just a f- utter lack of understanding about mm-hmm. U.S. law or European law or what the processes and the structures. The one area where I do think we have some real differences are in kind of our love of our our First Amendment and our free speech rights. And I have, I will say, in my time at CDT, become a fairly hardline First Amendment advocate that I would rather see the marketplace of ideas sort itself out. And that was not the effect I thought the place was going to have on me, and it, and it really has. Coming well, in, especially as someone who'd worked in privacy all these years, those two values are, are constantly put up as intention. And I take the double whammy of the Sony issue, the Sony attack, and then the very tragic Charlie Hebdo attack, mm. really as being back-to-back attacks on speech. Because as much as we want to make fun of, you know, the, the frivolous emails and whatever that came out of the Sony attack, the real attack was, we're threatening you with bodily harm if you go see that movie. And that is a form of speech. Going to see a movie, mm. whether it's a great sure. intellectual movie or a frivolous, you know, holiday, whatever, that is my free speech, right? And as a corollary of that, all of those stores around those movie theaters and malls, all the other collateral damage of that impact were very significant and and should not be underestimated. Similarly, obviously, and much more drastically, the Charlie Hebdo attack was an attack on free speech. And so here's, you know, terrorism, essentially, Mm -hmm. using attacks on free speech as as a weapon. And that's very, very concerning to me. And I think it's something we, as a society and, 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 and as a world, really need to be vigilant about. Nula, in the end, can technology come to the rescue? Yes, thank you for asking that. Is that all? That is always my my answer to almost everything. Is even if technology got us into this problem, technology can get us out of it. But let me also really close by saying I am a big believer in the wonders of technology. Personally, technology enables my crazy busy working mom life. <laughs> but on a much bigger scale, I've seen again when I worked at GE and worked on on some healthcare technology issues, the amazing outcomes that technology can have in saving lives, improving lives, improving outcomes, lowering costs. 
at Amazon on the great devices and the, the not only really fun entertainment side of it, but the human efficiency and, and amazing impact on the daily lives of busy families in energy, in the environment, in healthcare, in education. Technology and data can be enablers of great, great societal benefit, of good. And we're just here to be a voice for you know, reason and thoughtfulness in the approach as we move towards that digital world. Well, Nula, let's hope that side wins out. Thanks so much for being on the show. Thanks so much for having me. That was Nula O'Connor, President and CEO of the Center for Democracy and Technology, here on Real Clear Radio Hour, brought to you by the Competitive Enterprise Institute. I'm your host, Bill Frezza. Please check out Real Clear Radio on Facebook or follow us on Twitter at Real Clear Frezza. And stop by RealClearMarkets.com, my go-to place for diverse views on political economics. Ahead... Legal scholar Randy Barnett, director of the Georgetown Center for the Constitution, weighs in on the corrosive effect on democracy of opaque government surveillance policies. Stay tuned.